of the council. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, I have the unique and honorable position of wearing two hats tonight, both a, a employee and PIO of Arizona Game and Fish and also a proud homeowner in Fountain Hills. So it is my pleasure and my honor to speak. And when I say that we have a village and we're all responsible for wildlife safety, it comes from the heart. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, what happened, what we can do. I, I won't speak a lot about the incidents, but I want to speak a lot about what we can do to hopefully uh, avoid having this kind of tragedy happen in the future. I have Officer Lawyer Laura Orschelln, excuse me, Laura Orschelln and Officer Curtis Herbert with me today. They'll be here to an answer questions after, from the council after I'm finished with my short presentation. So on, on April 30th, there was a serious attack here in Fountain Hills of Havelina on a resident in Fountain Hills. Um, the resident was in the hospital for many days. She underwent surgery, and it was a situation that was very bad but could have been a lot worse. And I stand up here to hopefully bring attention to what happened and some things that residents can do. Um, there was no blame except for the people that did one thing, feeding wildlife in this town. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But first I want to talk about Arizona's wildlife and motivations of wildlife. When you see this picture, what do you think? What, do, what comes to mind? What emotion do you see? Do you see... Everyone in here has an opinion about this picture, and some of you are thinking, a nuisance animal that's in my yard eating my landscaping. <laughs> Other people in this room are thinking, a beautiful animal that I love to take pictures of and I want to get close to. And then there's everything in between. Why are they here? Because our landscaping provides natural habitat for animals. This is how we want to see Havelina. They're here because we live on the edge, we have a beautiful place in Fountain Hills, we're on the edge of the desert, and they're here because we provide habitat in our own yard that mimics the desert, and so they come close. When we feed wildlife, they come closer, and that becomes dangerous. These are some of the things that residents can do to attract javelina to their backyard unintentionally, literally rolling out the welcome mat for javelina planting desert plants, prickly, like prickly pear, desert trees like mesquite, they eat the mesquite pods, um, fertilizer, seeds, ornamental plants, things that Havelina love to eat. This is not a uh, cause for alarm, that's what we do in Fountain Hills. What becomes dangerous is on the right hand side, as you can see, when people feed pet food, um, when people leave out their garbage, even uh, unintentionally, when they sp spread bird seed or put quail blocks on the ground and wonder why they're gone the next day. And then the last one, I have a garbage again, but that just reminds me of, look what's on the ground below the javelinas. It may be human food to, our, to us, but it's essentially garbage. And we don't need to be feeding javelina uh, these things. These are some things about javelina that you should know. The javelina have a really poor eyesight. They're like a big rhinoceros. Well, I should say a little rhinoceros. But they have the heart of a rhinoceros. They have a really great sense of smell. They are fearful of humans naturally. Notice I have that in italics, naturally. They hate dogs. Dogs and javelinas are oil and water. Javelinas smell dogs, they think coyote. Coyotes are predators and they're enemies. Whether or not they have babies or not, they're enemies. They smell dogs, they smell a poodle, they smell a Rottweiler or, or Shih Tzu, they smell coyote. They're easily spooked, sometimes they charge towards you in the wrong direction when they're actually trying to just run away. Take a look at this picture. Some of you fall on one side or the other, and most of you are probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you might be surprised to realize that the person on the left is actually doing the most harm. And the person on the, re the left is the stereotype of the reason why Havelina were killed um, in, this, in this case. We'll talk a little bit about that. You may not be aware of the law that has actually been passed for several years now. 19, uh, 2009 actually, it's unlawful to feed wildlife except for tree squirrels. We don't have, tree, uh, except for birds and tree squirrels, we don't have tree squirrels in Fountain Hills. So if you're feeding the animals besides birds, you are feeding wildlife and that's a crime. Uh, you can, it's a petty offense. So what's going on here? What ha why do javelinas become aggressive when they're fed? Over time, javelinas lose their fear of people. 
And when they lose their fear of people, they become bold. Some of these bold animals turn aggressive. When those turn aggressive, they can sometimes attack. They told me at work that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the first attack would happen that I would have to go to the media with and explain what happened and why someone was seriously injured or even killed. I never thought it would be in my own town, which gives me a more motivation to be up here tonight and honored to be speaking to you so that we can make a change in our town. We have to work as a village to prevent people feeding wildlife. So studies show that adults who are tolerant of people, uh, adult javelina that are tolerant of people actually pa can pass on that trait to their young. And what happens when javelina get aggressive? Then sometimes they do nip, and sometimes they actually have a response that we saw, like we saw the other, um, a couple weeks ago. Most conflicts, not all, with javelina are dog related. These are some of the things that you can do. Keep your dog on a leash, non-retractable. Be aware of your surroundings. Take someone with you at all times. That's pretty much uh, good advice in any situation. Here are some things you can do when you're walking your dog. Um, walk in the other direction. Please don't run. Make yourself really big and use loud noises and uh, you can clap your hands. You can have pick up something really big and basically make yourself threatening to the animal. If you have a hiking stick, great. Chemical deterrence, mace, that all works well too. In this case, that happened on the 30th of April, she did nothing wrong. Uh, the dogs did not bark. They, she did not have them on a retractable leash. She had them on a six-foot leash. Uh, she, what, they weren't barking. Everything was calm. And it, we can easily point to feeding as an, a, as an issue in this case. And it, really, we need to take it very seriously. Regularly fed animals become habituated. Uh, again, this is, uh, they become aggressive, may become aggressive towards pets and people. We get reports every week of pets being chased or injured by, by, by javelina or coyotes. And when we, when it's a human related issue, we take that very seriously and it's a public safety issue. We do remo remove animals. We don't generally remove animals when a pet is involved. So what can we do? So here are some things that we can, you can do if you have javelina in your yard and they're, in, and they're becoming bold. Make loud noises, rattle empty soda cans, bang pots and pans. Basically, you, uh, you want to haze these animals so that they don't feel comfortable around your yard. They'll go to your neighbor's yard. <laughs> so you have to tell your neighbor as well to do these same things. A 10% household ammonia solution in a super soaker works great. Uh, one resident told me yesterday that she puts a rag soaked with ammonia outside of her door when they come around, so, or when she smells them around, and that keeps them away from the door. But why are they coming around? Why are they so close in? Yes, they're attracted to our, our landscaping, but here's the situation. In the, in the cases where we've had people report nuisance wildlife, Almost every case we could connect to feeding in the immediate vicinity. I'm not talking a mile away. I'm talking within a few doors down. And that was the case in the situation that happened on the 30th. We had two people who were feeding wildlife. One admitted right there that he had been, and then he stopped. Another person had moved out of the area two months prior. Javelinas still remembered that feeding on that street, on that very street that the accident, the, the attack, excuse me, the attack occurred. Um, no no violations, no citations were issued because the problems were no longer there. But as you can see, it's an ongoing problem in town that we need to take very seriously. Um, we encourage people to keep their yard clean of things that might attract javelinas, such as irrigation hoses, fallen citrus. Some people say, well, I just feed the birds. But if they don't clean up that bird seed that's on the ground at night, that's when the javelinas come in, and they will make your house a regular stop on their route. What can you do? Please, 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 I can't ask you enough times to call. I have had many people since this has happened told me that they have had a neighbor or know of someone that has been feeding wildlife, either intentionally or unintentionally. Please report them. It could save a life. You can be anonymous. It's a 1-800 number. And we, if, if everyone reported these things happening, you would get you would, obviously we can't have 100% compliance, but I think you'd really see these nuisance cases go down. Everyone wants to see wildlife in town. Well, most people. That's why we live here. 
we don't want to kill animals. That is the last, ultimate last resort. We love animals here at Game and Fish. That's why we got into this job. I know that the town people love javelina, love animals in general, and don't want to see killing happen. But when people are involved, we make decisions and we have to make choices. And ultimately, we blame the people that change the behavior of, these, of wildlife. It's going to require an active and united approach by our community to get this to stop. We need to stop feeding wildlife. We need to not be accepting of people who do feed wildlife in town. I have a short video to play. To market, to market, to buy a fat pig, home again, home again, jiggity jig. The only problem we have here, folks, is that these aren't pigs. These are pickeries, known commonly as javelinas, in our backyard down here in Tucson. They're coming in every morning now for breakfast. They're eating the Alpo dog food that I feed the coyotes. So they're in here cleaning it up before the coyotes have at it. So. You know, they're not afraid of us at all. Oh, yeah, they, they don't like each other. Well, thank God I'm not down there. I wouldn't want one of these guys to have, let me have it because they have very sh sharp fangs or tusks, and uh, they can really cut you up good. People down here, believe it or not, hunt these things and eat them. But, uh... In closing, thank you for allowing me to speak today about how we can keep our wildlife wild. We want to keep wildlife wild and alive. And the best thing we can do is to discourage everyone from feeding in town, make it a community issue. And if you have any questions at all, I'm available to... Um, I, would, I am going to be speaking on Monday at 6.30, uh, excuse me, Monday at 5.30 at the Community Center. And I'd love to entertain questions. I'll also have um, my cohorts here from Game and Fish to answer questions as well. And it's, uh, we really hope that everyone shows up to find out how they can make their, our community safer. So thank you. Well, Ranger Amy, I want to thank you for being so proactive and so quickly contacting us and helping to resolve the situation. Um, I know we're all saddened about what happened because most of us, you know, we do love the animals and we realize that these animals wouldn't have been in this situation had not the humans stepped in and decided that they wanted to feed them and make them like sort of like domestic pets. Um, but you, you stepped up quickly, you <coughs> contacted me, um, and then you so quickly came up with this presentation, uh, which you, I know you put together in such a short amount of time. Um, I, I, I think the biggest thing that we can stress is that uh, what I've been hearing from people is, oh, I didn't want to tell on my neighbor. But I, I think, like you said, we, we have to stress that you're, you might be reporting your neighbor, but you're protecting your neighborhood. And that's what we need to focus on right now. And I think that's going to change the whole attitude of how people uh, deal with, with neighbors who are now feeding them. I know we've heard stories about people going out and hand feeding them corn and, and you know, the animals feeling so comfortable that they come right up to them. So that's, that it's going to take a while then, I would imagine, before we can kind of get back. Do you think that that neighborhood is safe at, that, at this time? or? I'm glad you asked that question, and thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh, for that. We, you may not know the total, um, some, uh, the media re has been reporting nine. We actually removed, we had removed 13 javelina in this area. On, uh, I'll, the chronology happened like this. So on the 30th, the attack happened. On the 5th of May, we didn't, re we didn't learn about the attack right away. It was a few days later. It was a uh, Tuesday. And on the 5th of May, we had our wildlife services go in and remove, they removed six javelinas from within a half mile of the attack site on King Street. Um, on the 10th, we re, on the 9th, we 
got a report of a near miss, a woman with a, ha with a greyhound who was chased by uh, three more javelina. So we knew we hadn't gotten them all. Uh, Wildlife Services went back in, removed three more on the 10th, and then four more on the 11th, bringing the total to, thir to 13 animals. Um, the tragedy here is that these animals didn't have to be removed. Um, but the bigger tragedy here was that the victim in the situation didn't have to go through what she went through. I strongly believe that if people hadn't been feeding in her immediate vicinity, she wouldn't have been had to undergo the traumatic and life-threatening injuries and surgeries that she went through. I played the video to show everybody just how serious a javelina attack can be um, and how serious this issue is. Thank you. Questions? Councilman Magazine. I just want to congratulate you on a, uh, an excellent presentation. Thank um, you. Like every other city in town, our single biggest problem is communication. How do you get the word out? We've got maybe, I don't know, 50 people, 70 people in here. Um, you're going to be at the community center. Uh, people who watch Channel 11 will see it. Have you thought about other ways to get the word out? For example, uh, an op-ed or an article of some kind in the Times. Um, have you thought about other ways to get the word? Because it's critically important. Sure, I would love to write an article for the Times. Absolutely. I well, the editor is sitting right back there. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> no, I would absolutely. And I've written an article for the Times before, um, and it's in there, and uh, other people have brought it up. Um, but I want to write an article specifically, you know, expressing how you know this could have been a lot worse. I could be standing up here, um, telling you about a death of a, one of our wonderful, wonderful residents who I got the opportunity to meet, and um, she's just a lovely person, and I'm so glad that she's recovering. And it's I'm not standing up here talking about something that far worse. I do have one question, and yes. that is, what do you do with the javelinas that you capture? Oh, I'm glad you asked, because we did um, send them in for testing, and the first group of javelinas were tested negative for rabies. Um, after they are, um, they're euthanized, or lethally removed, I should say, killed, they are, they are killed. Um, they are, their bodies are frozen and they are sometimes necropsies, but in this case I believe they were just sent away for rabies testing and then they're disposed of. If I may, just one follow-up. Um, I didn't realize that you, you euthanized them. Um, that's 13. 13. I suspect we have many, many more. How do you determine how many to do this with? And that's, and that's an excellent question. We don't know if we have them all. Uh, we know of two, situ two specific places in town. One is right near Malta King's Tree in the area of the dog park. That's where these animals were removed. We also have a situation where people have been feeding within the last two years in the area of Boulder and Eagle's Nest, um, Golden Eagle Boulevard. Um, more, more than two situations of feeding and one letter written um, in that area. Too. So there are two separate parts of town. There are more than, so there, are more than, there is more than one herd involved in this. We can't know if we got them all, but um, we refuse to go in and kill wildlife for that, for the sake of killing wildlife. This was a targeted um, operation, and we hope and believe that we got at least most of the offending animals. But the, um, really, it's going to be time, you know, changing over time, changing the habits, changing um, when javelinas are no longer fed in, ha in Fountain Hills, that's when they will start being normal, natural, wild javelinas again, and that's what we can hope for. Congratulations. Thank you. Questions? No. And I know that, um, Grady, we're going to be putting this on our website. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The website and then Channel 11 will be continuously <coughs> playing. And we obviously are missing out on a lot of the snowbirds who are not here right now. Mm -hmm. And so um, Amy and I discussed um, for her to have a similar type of workshop, maybe in November, January, sometime, once the population increases with people, because we, we tend to believe that there might be people that are not year-round residents that might be um, feeding the animals as well. So we want to try to hit just about as many people as we can. So that will be the next step after uh, the summer, I think. Another um, option you were asking about how to get the word out, um, we recently did a, we have a, perig a, a peregrine webcam that Arizona Game and Fish runs, and you can watch a peregrine chick growing up in the nest. It's really cool at the downtown Phoenix High Rise building. Uh, we've gotten a lot of interest, and we had a live chat with some of our biologists. Um, I would be happy to do a live chat with, um, and, and right. people from the town could chat in through, our, through the town's website, for, um, through the town's Facebook page, and that would be fairly easy to set up. 
as well, and then people could ask questions in live time. Wow, we appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure we sounds could set that idea. up. That sounds like a great idea. So I guess at the end, the word is that we are asking people who know of people in their neighborhood to please use this phone number or contact you or contact the town and just do it as soon as possible so that we can find out which neighborhoods people are feeding them so that perhaps it's another area too that's affected. We're not going to know that unless people call us and it's, it's good that people know they can do it anonymously if they feel uncomfortable about calling on their neighbor. But as far as I, I, my opinion is that any neighbor that is putting the entire neighborhood in jeopardy like this deserves to be reported on. So Absolutely. I hope everybody will do that and uh, we will do everything we can. We'll see you on Monday too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you, Council.